Insured? It's insured. Good. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and um, it's, uh, you know, we can always sit here and say it's my honor to be here, it's my honor to be here, but this is what my life has led up to. Um, I've dedicated my whole life to our country, our community, and I'm looking at a whole audience of people that are probably going to do the same exact thing, and I'm flanked to my left and right of men who've made their mark in history, so um, thank you for having me, and Let's talk to some individuals who are just a tiny bit more interested than me. And for those who are going to venture into the service out there, I just want to let you know that make sure at a certain time in your life you're able to consult with veterans who served before you did, because that's what I did. And this is what made me a successful person in life is finishing my own service and then consulting with those who led long, successful lives after war, after their military service, um, because it made me a sharper person and made me uh, make more brilliant decisions in my life. I think I'll start to the right-hand side with Mr. Robert Chunard, who okay. served with the 128th Anti-Aircraft Battalion during the Second World War from France all the way to Germany. And Bob, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your job was in the military, what your responsibility was? Yes, I, I was surprised to find out that I was going to be a gunner. I was sent to El Paso, Texas, soon after I got inducted into the services, introduced to a 90-millimeter <laughs> gun. I was going to be the gunner. And we had about eight guys who were going to serve with me as, as my crew. We had four guns, all 90 millimeter, in our battery. We had four batteries, but battery B, the battery I was in, sort of stood alone. I didn't see here hardly anybody. I lived with this battery. We went through the war together, and when it all ended in August, uh, I don't know, June or August, I uh, forgot when it ended, I was in uh, Austria, we separated. And that was the end of it. For two years, I was with this outfit, and it's now all gone. But anyway, the 88 was a copy uh, uh, of our gun. We were similar guns. We had such respect for a German 88 that I don't know if we had the same respect with a 90. But anyway, we shot field artillery, but mostly at airplanes. <coughs> we had a radar outfit they would sit in the middle of a field with our four guns around the outside, so all wired to it. And that radar was a boxy thing with a big ear on it, scanning the sky, picking up enemy planes. We always had a foxhole near our gun. We had a little campfire that would cook uh, maybe uh, some coffee or Maybe if we had uh, some eggs or something like that, a treat, uh, we could uh, sit around that fire. And we washed our clothes in our helmets. We lived there, right by a foxhole, and we didn't stay stray away from it. We had to stay close to that gun all the time. We, next thing we know after we got training, I was in a field in England with an infantry outfit that we didn't know anything about. But I saw a sign that said 29th Infantry Division. Well, that didn't mean too much to me, but at the time, they were training in one part of the field, and we were training in the other, getting our guns ready for invasion. Now, these guns had to be greased and oiled and protected to the ultimate. 
so that when we hit the beach on an LST, if we had to go through water with that tank tractor pulling our guns, it had to keep functioning. In order to do so, it had to be well greased. Well, finally, one day, an inspection team came and checked our guns and said they weren't good enough. They had to keep doing it. Well, this is where luck played in my part. And luck played in my part and probably your part all your life. The 29th Division pulled out. They hit the beach. They were the first wave. I don't know when we would have been with them if our guns were ready. But we had to keep them prepared. So we missed the first wave. As it turned out, I didn't hit that beach for five days. I didn't feel bad about it, <laughs> actually, but I did feel a little let down. When we finally got on the beach, five days later, the fighting was up in the back of the beach, but we went to a different direction to a bombed out 88 gun position that was just captured. And we set our guns up in that same area where those, that German outfit was destroyed. And we waited for, for a while and General Patton finally arrived on the beach. It was probably about a month and a half after D-Day. <laughs> when he bombed on the beach, my battery B, <coughs> get in line with a convoy and at St. Low, they blasted a big opening in that defense. And off we went. My outfit went spearheading with a tank outfit and an infantry outfit. Other outfits did the same thing. They went spearheading here, we went spearheading there. And we traveled that way, spearheading, hitting things and moving fast. Everything was hunky-dory until finally we, we were coming to the Rhine River. It was, holy mackerel, we got to cross that Rhine River. It was a fear of like crossing that channel. What was going to be on the other side? So, Bob, I'm going to hold you at the Rhine River. Yes, yes. And we're going to continue on the Rhine River when I come back to you. I'm going to ask the other veteran, other veterans there, Pop. I'm sorry if I it's took all right. too much time. Um, sorry. So to my left, we have Robert S. White on the far left here. Robert served with the 17th Airborne Division, one of the least known airborne divisions during World War II that made a jump into Germany in March of 1945. And so, Bob, why don't you tell us about Operation Varsity? Well, first of all, I want to say that I'm looking out here amongst a handsome gentlemen and gorgeous ladies. <laughs> and I feel a whole lot safer since I know that all of you is doing your thing for America. That's right, the future. Uh, you, uh, Tell us about um, Operation Varsity, okay. You're the role you played. The, uh, you know, of course, when I came over here, I, I, I landed in England, and in Liverpool, when I got out of the, we got off the ship, and lined us up outside. And they were telling about, uh, I missed the Normandy jump. It had already happened. So they had uh, so many casualties till they wanted re volunteer to replace them. So I volunteered. I think there's three or four of us. Huh? And they you joined the 507th Parachute Infantry. Well, I didn't know what it was. They said, 
Because they, all they did is say they needed somebody to replace them. Sure. So I was, I said, well, I'm a boy amongst them men, but one of them I can fit right in. So I volunteered. Anyhow, they sent me to a jump school in England. I'd never been on a plane before. And they said, you gotta get on this plane here. We're gonna go to a jump zone. So I had to jump out of the first plane I ever rode. <laughs> so it didn't stop, kept right on. They was in such a hurry for us to, you have to make five jumps to get your rig. We'd made three in a row. And then the last day, we had to jump two times. We jumped, went, got on the truck, went right back to the airport, got on another plane, jumped again, made our five jumps for the wings, for when you win. Uh, then time passed for a while. Then we made a, a, a training jump. Then, then that was six jump. On the seventh jump, it was on the Rod River, or <coughs> over the Rod, I would say. So your seventh jump was into combat. Yeah. Uh, we landed. Our jump zone was in Weasel, for Germany. Uh, for some reason, my I was a little late. Getting out, I guess. But I didn't drop in the drop zone that well, I was supposed to. So I, I landed over in the woods. And I heard somebody took you back to those woods. <coughs> I heard someone. <coughs> I heard someone took you back to those woods 75 years later. Then I got a telephone call one day. And I thought it was a scammer, because it was a funny voice. And I said, I think I've heard that before. But I, I, I wasn't sure. So with his uh, Boston dialect, my Southern, but you know, for some reason, uh, when I wanted to talk back to, I called him Mr. Andrew. Did I do it? Yes, you did. Uh, for some reason, I just knew it was something important. Then he went on about his book, and uh, I, I gave him all the answers I could. Right then, and he said, I'm coming up to see you. I live in Virginia, he lives in Massachusetts. And him and four of his, th three of his brothers, buddies, all police officers, they drove to Virginia. And we met at the, what was it, Texas Roadhouse. That's right. And uh, next day we, he came to my house, and he didn't get interested in talking to me. He went over and looked at all my trophies for running. I've been running for a long time. What people don't realize is Bob White started running marathons at age 60. <laughs> and we had the ability to bring him back to his drop zone in Germany 77 years later. And that was uh, one of the best moments of my life, standing on his drop zone with him 77 years later. And we'll, we'll go back to the uh, Operation Varsity. I'm gonna swing it to the next vet for now. <laughs> I'll stay to my left with this gentleman here in camouflage fatigues, which many may know. He's done, he only started getting involved with associations and returning to Europe in his elderly years. And he goes by the name of Vincent Speranza, a 101st Airborne veteran, defender of Bastogne and liberation 
of concentration camps. And one thing I love about Vincent is that he's brought so much awareness to what's la last of our World War II veterans. Very often you can find him on the internet in a trending video, but more than not, if you ever go to visit Bastogne, he's left his mark there forever. And so, Vincent, I'd like to speak to you. A lot of people talk about Bastogne, but I also want to talk about um, the liberation of, of, of camps. I feel like a lot of our youth um, were, were drifting away from those discoveries. Yeah, well, uh, it's uh, April. By now, uh, well, I wrote a book, book and uh, the, the details are in the book. But ja January the 5th, uh, as we broke out of uh, Bastogne, I got wounded and uh, flown to a British hospital and so on. And uh, a piece of shrapnel had gone on the, under my eye. They thought it was hitting the brain, and so they. Uh, sent me to a British hospital. Uh, the, the point I want to make is that I was out of the out for 11 days, that's six days in the hospital, and five in, in the uh, uh, recuperation leave they gave us to Scotland. Rehab. When I got back to the outfit, uh, the, uh, it had moved out from there, and uh, so we had to go find it. And we found that uh, the 101st Airborne was now being used as regular ground troops. They put us in trucks and, and move us, there's a hot spot here, there's a place there, and so on. And uh, we, we were still taking casualties right up till the end of the war. The, uh, in, in April, we were in uh, Bavaria, uh, in Germany, and, and uh, they told us, uh, as we got off the trucks, there's a, we think there's some Germans in the woods here, we gotta go clean out this woods. Uh, okay, uh, form a skirmish line five yards apart, fix bayonets, and go through the woods. Well, uh, there were no Germans. The foxholes were empty. The further we advanced, though, we, we started noticing a smell. The further we walked, the stronger the smell got. Nobody, don't forget, we were 18, 19-year-old kids then. By that time, we were good, tough combat troops. But in terms of life experiences, so we, right out of high school, we, we went into the service. And so uh, nobody was prepared for the, the clearing that we came on. 12-foot high barbed wire fences, a double row of fences all around. A big hole dug in the middle of the compound and the bulldozer is sitting here. At the far end of the compound, thrown like garbage, not even the dignity of being laid out, a pile of, I don't know if I should be going into this kind of detail, but they're all adults, there are no kids here, right? Yep thrown like garbage, a pile of bodies, uh, all sizes, small ones, big ones, babies, old men, old ladies, and so on. On the right-hand side, the bones were still smoking in the ovens where they were going to get rid of the uh, evidence. On the left side, there was a, a big shed with cubby holes. One person in each there, like, like, a, like a, a pigeonhole on the desk. Some of them alive, some of them dead, some of them hanging there with their mouths open and so on. And, and uh, nobody, you know, in the movies, you see them all standing, walking around. No, nobody could walk in this place. They were all crawling around on their elbows and, and uh, to suddenly see that thing, and realized that, uh, hey, those people hadn't done anything, only because they were Jews. This was a government policy that we're going to get rid of a, 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 uh, one race of people. My friend, when, when, when we first 
came upon this scene, we just uh, shocked. Everybody's shaking their heads like this now. Nah, I can't believe it. How, how could one human being do this to another? You, you, the, the, the disbelief. Some of the guys just slid down and started crying. Other guys are shooting their rifle up in the air. Some of them were just, all, all of us were, were just shaking their heads saying, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe this. this is we had heard rumors about concentration camps, but they were for criminals. Here was this bunch of people. Uh, don't forget, we were 18 and 19 year old kids. To see this thing there, someone just shocked us. The guys came in, crawling on, on their elbows and, and hugging our feet and kissing our boots and uh, comrade, comrade. The, 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 it was just too much to take in and we didn't know what the hell to do. You try to help them, they can't touch them. They're in, they're in such pain that you can't lift them off the ground. And the, the one that was uh, hugging my feet kept saying something like Madja, 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 which I understood to be Hungarian. And my friend uh, Steve Pentek uh, was Hungarian. I said, Steve, come on, what's this guy saying? And it was Hungarian. And Steve says, um, you see that little pond right out there? He says, there's fish in it. Well, we knew what to do about that. So we. Uh, uh, took a hand grenade through it and damn fruit. the fish all come up to the top of the pond. And here these people crawling down to the pond and eating the fish raw. And, and we, you know, we tried to give them chocolate. So the, the, the medical officers came, don't feed them. They got to be given a special food and so on, so on, so on. That scene, that scene, that day, imprinted itself here, and, and I, I'm sorry, but to this day, I have not been back to Germany, and I, have been there. I said, you, you're, you're not human beings, you're fucking animals. You, 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 you can't tell me, you can't tell me that you're a regular human being if you're willing to do things like this to people who had done nothing only because you didn't like their religion. And uh, from that day, we did not take one privilege. H Company didn't anyway. I don't know what the rest of the story was. I, uh, I wrote this in the book as, a, as an example of what was happening near the end of the war. And I, uh, I became a school teacher later in New York City, and, and, and a lot of my teacher friends were uh, Jewish. And when I described this kind of thing to them, you know, they wanted to hear it from me. They, they said, uh, Vincent, we're adopting a new attitude. Never mind the turn the other cheek. The, the next time, not to the, to the gas chambers with a Bible, but with a gun. And uh, about that time, 1948, the state of Israel became, and, and uh, finally I found some peace to that scene that at least now, hey, they managed, they put a country together and so on and so on, and now there's a regular Israeli company and, and uh, they're not uh, gonna wait in gas chambers for you to, to knock them off. You know, you fool around with Israel today and you, uh, uh, are in trouble. Uh, I, I, that's not the high point for me of the war, but, but it was one of the most dramatic moments. I, you know, we were innocent kids at age 18 when we went into the service. Uh, <laughs> you know, Back then, the, it was easy to be a good kid because the, the only three influences on your life were uh, the church, the school, and, and your parents. And they were all saying the same thing, be a good boy, 
If you go to school, you pay attention to your teachers. And the teachers would say, yes, well, be a good boy and pay attention to the priest. And the priest said, pay attention to your <laughs> teachers. And, and so, you know, but you go to war and you go into combat. Things change, my friend. You're no longer an innocent. Uh... I wrote a poem that describes that first day of combat. I'd like to read it to you. It's called The Kid with a Machine Gun. It was December of 1944, the 18th to be exact, when the hungry, tired soldiers did pour from off the truck with their packs and told to dig a hole in the ground. And it was cold, cold, cold. The wind blew through their summer clothes and feet froze through and through. But these were paratroopers all and given a job to do. No weather was going to stop these boys. And we waited and waited and waited. We checked and checked and checked our guns. Our fingers were stiff and sore. The enemy was near, we knew. Get ready, sight that bore. Put a round in the chamber and click it home. And we stamped and stamped and stamped our feet. My fingers are still stiff and sore. <laughs> the experience calmly lit a butt and cupped it in their hand. The young kid with the machine gun just hoped that he could stand. They all gave him the thumbs up, you'll make it, little man. And you force a smile, but your mouth runs dry. The fog and the mist begin to rise. Daylight comes at last. Stirrings from the other side. Artillery comes whizzing past. Not yet, says the lieutenant. Not yet, not yet, not yet. And our fingers were sticking to the trigger. And then the sound we dreaded most, the clank of treads and wheel, and the 88s grind to a halt, and the tanks belch red-hot steel. And fear begins to clutch the heart. You shiver a little, but you blend the cold. The enemy starts across the field. White snow capes frustrate our aim. Lieutenant, God damn it, they're coming on. Are we just playing the game? Not yet, not yet, not yet, says he. And the wind blows swirls and swirls of snow. The machine gun kid hears not the din, waiting only for word or plan, his thoughts exploding again and again. Would the kid become a man? He sets his sights at 400 yards and squints through the people. And the figures get larger and larger as they come on. Now, now, now the command, hoarsely through the noise. My gun erupts. I grin and shout and curse, traverse and curse, my fear is gone, replaced by joy. As I watch the figures fall, they turn to lifeless mud, and the snow turns red with blood. Now the enemy falters, stops, and turns back. No victory cries or shouts of glee as we all turn around and view the bodies of our boys lying on the ground. All oh, the cost, the cost of that day's work, lies heavily on the brow. The mighty Airborne 101 is less in numbers now, but we stop them cold, though odds of seven to one, no Nazi boot ever entered Bastogne. And the machine gun kid had indeed become a man. We the living seek not the glory, only the realization of our terrible losses. Save your honor, praise, and prayers for brave men, these rows of white crosses.
That's when you change, friends, from an innocent kid to a, a person who has now finally figured out, you know, we take for granted what we've, how we've lived in this country. Too many people forget that, uh, my friends, I just want to mention one more thing, Andy, yes, okay? On May the 7th, we, we got to Birch's Garden, and it was the first time we didn't have to fight for the, the, the people there had uh, put the white sheets and blankets and so on out the windows indicating surrender. And, and so uh, we uh, went into that town without firing a shot. And we found out, now the Birch's Garden is at the foot of the mountain where Hitler's eagles nested, at the top of the mountain. And of course, we all wanted to see Hitler's uh, eagle's nest. And so we, uh, you know, the elevators were at work and steps uh, to the top of the mountain. But hey, when you're 19 years old, you can do anything. And so we, we went up to the eagle's nest. A bomb had hit the place. And uh, stuff was scattered all over the place. And here we are getting um, uh, souvenirs, picking up stuff, and so on and so on. And that's when word came to us, the war's over, May the 8th. The, the Germans have surrendered, and, and uh, the, uh, we're going to go home. I happened to glance at the wall, and there was a map, about three feet by five feet, a map of the world, color-coded in three colors, brown, Germany, green was Italy, and red was Japan. My friends, the cocky bombs had already decided how they were going to divide up the world. They were sure they were going to win, and they, they, they had mapped out Germany was to get all of Europe uh, down to the Mediterranean, uh, the Ukraine up to the Euro Mountains and Russia, Germany was to get Canada and the United States. Italy was to get Africa and South America. And Japan was to get all of Asia, all the way down to including Australia. If anybody ever doubted why that war had to be fought and why it had to be won, there was on the wall. The future of the world was three men we're going to run the whole thing, and 95% of us would be slave labor. Uh, people should be reminded of that every damn day. That, but you know what I'm saying. In, in schools and so on and so on, in the early days we did. I'm afraid today our young people are, aren't being taught the same way that we, we taught the world and, and, and what happened and, and, and what World War II was about. In fact, I found out in one school that I went to, in the textbook for the course, they covered World War II in a page and a half. Now you tell me what kids can learn about World War II, the most cataclysmic event of the 20th century, in, in a page and a half. You know, mm -hmm. The thing is, we've let the ball go. We've forgotten to, to sure. really pay attention to the schools. And, and I, uh, in all my speeches, I, I holler at parents, hey, find out what your kids are learning. Take a look and, and, and see what they're getting, and, and uh, you know you can make adjustments. And uh, I'm sorry I went over time. No, it's okay. Um, I thought that was remarkable, Vincent. We always talk about Bastone, um, and for those who don't know his book, his book is called Nuts, and it's a hell of a story. But um, we always talk about the joyful uh, beer run story <laughs> he did in Bastone, which you can look up yourself. But it was good to hear the other side of it with the concentration camps. <laughs> I've saved the best for last. Uh, because the 87th Division is one of my favorite units in particular during the Second World War. It's the most veterans I've met from one particular uh, division that I've met um, coincidentally, the Golden Acorns. And next to me is Jack Moran from the 347th Regiment. Oh, here it is, right here. Yeah, it is, the Golden Acorn, K Company. <laughs> and the 87th Division got to Europe in November of 44. A little later than other units, but they hit the ground running during the Battle of the Bulge. And Jack, let's hear about um, some of your experiences, particularly about the Battle of the Bulge. Okay, I'll lead up to that. First, the first morning we were going into action was 
early in December. We were in current farm country, so it was very flat and, and very open. The first morning, we, get, we got the signal to get out of our foxholes and start advancing. We got out of our foxholes and started to move. In about the first 15 seconds, seven of our men were down. ADH came screaming in, machine guns opened up on us. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? I don't belong here. Get me out of here. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was just very scary. Uh, but we, the 88, as I agree with, with Bob, that 88 was the, most, the meanest weapon on the face of the earth at that time. An 88 properly placed can dominate a battlefield. So accurate, so fast. Uh, and then they mounted, the, the, the Tiger tank had an 88 mounted on it, and that, that made that a tremendous combination. It did terrific, terrific damage to, to us and our troops, as, as well as uh, our, our tanks. In the tank corps, there's a saying, if, if you want to go after a Tiger tank, send out four Shermans, hope to get one back. It, it was that bad. <laughs> the, the, the Tiger, the Tiger could knock out a Sherman at half a mile. A Sherman had to get within 500 feet of the Tiger before it could start to fire. And then it still couldn't knock the Tiger out because the steel plating on the hood of the Tiger was four inches thick. One day I saw a 105, one of our pretty, pretty good pieces of artillery, land on the hood of a Tiger tank. Big explosion, a lot of dust, a lot of smoke. And I thought to myself, gee, that's great. They knocked that one out. When the smoke cleared, that tiger tank just backed into the woods and went someplace else. A, a tremendous weapon. Uh, and of course, the, the Germans had the, the, the fastest machine gun in the world. Their machine gun was, would fire at 1,200 rounds a minute, which means every second, 20 bullets are coming out of the barrel of that weapon. Uh, no one that I know of ever got hit by only one machine gun bullet. They were so close together, it's just like a beam of light. If you get hit by one, you get hit by more, much more than one. It was, it was, uh, 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 those are tough battlefield weapons and, 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 and killed an awful lot of our people. Going up to the bulge, the bulge broke the 16th of December. 200,000 German troops came storming through the Ardennes forest. It was supposed to be a very lightly guarded, defended position because no one would think of coming through the woods that way, militarily. But here these Germans came screaming through the woods in the early morning of the 16th of December, backed up by tanks. They got tanks through those trees. They, they destroyed the 106th Division, which was resting in this area. They destroyed them. They had so many casualties, they had to write the, the 106th Division off. We had 100, over 100,000 dead and wounded in the bulge. And that was mainly in a four-week period from the 16th of December to the middle of January. Uh, it, it was the costliest American victory in history. It was the greatest land uh, battle ever fought in the history of warfare. There's never been a bigger one. Uh, it, it was just just horrific. I was, uh, uh, General Bradley had a meeting with Montgomery, and Montgomery was the English general, and with George Patton. And Bradley said, look, fellas, we gotta get up to Belgium to help stop this bulge. Montgomery said, well, I can be up there in four or five days. George Patton hated Montgomery, and he said, I'll be up there in three days. He wasn't about to be oh, beat, beat by Montgomery. If Montgomery Monty said, I'll be up there in two days, Brad, uh, Patton would have said, I'll be up there tomorrow. That, that was, their competition was so fierce. So Bradley gave us the, the, the put Patton the job of getting up to Belgium. And I got a news, newspaper article, and the title of it was Patton, moves Third Army in, in, 40, in, in 40 hours to Belgium. And right below that it says, Eisenhower said it couldn't be done. 
but we did it. Uh, I, I remember always an open bed truck. We never had a heated vehicle or anything enclosed vehicle. Always open bed trucks, and we froze to death. It was the toughest winter in 50 years. Snow all over the ground, low temperatures. Uh, we were open bed trucks just with our just with our clothing on. We didn't have any overcoats or anything like that. Uh, it, it was a mean trip, but we, we got up there. Uh, I still remember sitting in the, 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 we, the day we got there, the next morning I can remember sitting in a snowbank at 4 o'clock in the morning sucking on a frozen turkey leg. That was my Christmas dinner for 1944. We uh, were about two miles west of Bastogne. And we were ordered to, to do certain things. We had objectives, road junctions, etc. So we, we started out marching through the woods. And uh, for the first few hours, everything went fine. We're, we're making progress. We haven't seen any Germans yet. But all of a sudden, we heard machine gun fire behind us. And we knew that we were cut off. So the, we were. We, the captain said, OK, dig in. So we dug in in a perimeter defense, just like in the old west, circle the wagon. And two men in a foxhole. And the Germans kept us pinned down in those foxholes for six days. And it, it was so cold. We had no blankets. We had no bedrolls. We, no, we had nothing to keep us warm except the clothes on our back, night and day. Uh, so we were, we were cold all the time, we were hungry all the time, we were scared all the time, uh, just a, a bad combination of uh, circumstances, but they had us pinned down, we couldn't move, uh, you couldn't get out of your foxhole to, because the Germans were throwing big mortars at us, and you could hear the mortar leave the tube because it made a ping. And so the Germans from about a mile away were throwing these big mortars at us. And you'd hear the ping. And we knew, from, quickly we learned, that it took 29 seconds for that shell to land on, on us. So after about 26 or 27 seconds, we'd get down as deep in our foxhole as we could, have it, make sure we had our steel helmets on, and just hope that the, the shell did not hit our hole. If it hit our hole, we were dead. There's no question, no question about that. I stopped you there, Jack. Hmm? Oh, we get, we're running out of time, actually. So uh, typically, we'd open up to questions. But we have some talkative World War II veterans here that have amazing stories. And I think everyone's fine with just hearing those guys talk, because these are some of the most powerful stories I've had. So let's give it a round of applause for these guys. <laughs>